Good afternoon. Hi there, or evening here on the East Coast. The time zone in which this show is. Uh, well, we are we are coming to you from our respective homes, mine being in New York City. I'm Gary Lambert. David Gans is out in Oakland, California. But all of us are in virtual form together in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So uh, if you want to simulate the smell vision aspect, you might want to cook a pot of chocolate pudding on your stove tonight during the show. and It'll smell more like Hershey. Even if you have it. What the heck? I thought I muted. What, what's going on? I thought I muted oh. both my devices and they started talking to me. That's the second time I've messed that up in the history of this show. I'm so sorry. You're hearing voices? No, I my my monitor, <laughs> I my know. TV is right next to me and the delay. I thought I had muted both the TV and the stereo, but guess what? I didn't mute both of them. So our voices started coming at us from over here. Now, I apologize for that. Let's get back to what we're doing, which is introducing Nugs.net's live feed of Dead & Company from Hershey, Pennsylvania. I don't know about That's you, right. but I've been just having the greatest time on this tour. Lambert and I both arrived at set break last night with our jaws on the floor from an amazing performance of Birdsong. And then the second set uh, blew us away even further with all kinds of good stuff. And it's been like that for the whole tour. So we're a uh, part of uh, Nugs.net's free preview thing. They're going to uh, show you the first song of the set for free over here on this YouTube thing. And if you like it, you can go to livedead.co or Nugs.net and sign up to buy the show, which will give you access to the entire thing in very, very high quality audio and video including, by the way, now on this tour, 4K video. Over to you, Gary. All right. Uh, David, I have to right a wrong from last night, because uh, as we were ending the set break, we were talking about the Toulon Vietnamese restaurant in San Francisco. Yeah. And my the last words heard from me was, oh, it's totally a greasy spoon, which would sound like a pejorative. <laughs> But I was going to go on to say, it's amazing. It's one of the great Vietnamese restaurants in the world. Julia Child called it her favorite restaurant in San Francisco. And who's going to argue with Julia? So I just wanted to put it, Toulon, Toulon is a decrepit, um, sanitarily marginal, um, you know, paint peeling kind of place. But the food is phenomenal. So I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't, I wasn't putting down Toulon. I'm very glad you were able to add that bit of information. And if everybody who's watching all of the shows will know exactly what we're talking about. And if you don't, it's not that big a deal. But there's a really excellent Vietnamese restaurant in San Francisco called Toulon. We're told that the band is on stage. So we're now waiting for that magical phrase, lights out. And once they turn out the house lights, we will shut up and turn it over to the stage. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Dead & Company have to offer us this evening. But we'll be back at set break with a very special guest. You're going to love this one. Are, are we not saying who it is? Oh, let's say who it is. Oh, it says so right below us. Bradford Morris Dallas. Right. Oh. <laughs> Trained professionals. So much kids. for suspense. That's us. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, are we sure. getting set? No, no house lights yet. But uh, anyway, really looking forward to talking to Brantford. Uh, he's one of my favorite people. Great musician, of course, has had some wonderful history in the Grateful Dead world. And uh, it's going to be a blast. So come back at set break and uh, we'll talk about that with Brantford and plenty more. I we hope he's watching the set. I hope so, too. Yeah, I'm I'm probably going to just mostly listen to that interview because I know you and Branford have plenty to say to each other, and uh, I'm not really up to speed on all that stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, the band is not on stage yet. We've got some time, Gary. So let's remind the viewers that uh, Nugs.net is offering an audio subscription package now as well that allows you unlimited access to their entire library of concert recordings which includes everything Dead & Company has ever played on stage going back to 2016. And what, the Rolling Stones, Jerry Garcia Band, Wilco, uh, Pearl Jam, huge amounts of stuff. 
from lots and lots of artists and a lot of obscure ones, including my own music is available at nugs.net and the subscription service as well. So that tells you how democratic it is from all the way up there to all the way down here. Uh, Nugs.net for that. And also that Sirius XM has a new platinum package that includes uh, access to selections from the Nugs.net library. So they would like you to go to livedead.co or Nugs.net to find out more about these various uh, things that are available from Nugs.net subscription packages, a concert, the the Dead and Company tour, et cetera. And I'll tell you, I think a lot of people who have been enjoying this tour are going to want to go back and listen to shows from this tour repeatedly because there has been so much great music played. Um, the band is really on fire. They're having a great time. Uh, I texted a little with Jeff Cometti today, and he was uh, very enthusiastic about the way things are going. So, uh a happy band tends to make some music that makes people happy. He does look very happy on the, uh, I, I love the way that they shoot these concerts. You get a lot of close-ups of the musicians making music. I've always enjoyed watching the hands on the fretboard and the hands on the keyboard and stuff like that. And close-ups of Mickey and Bill behind the drums. It's, it's a lot of fun watching it, you know, from the, the uh, comfort of your couch where you have, I don't know, eight or 10 cameras showing you all the stuff that's going on. And then they also sweep through the audience and you get to see your friends on the rail and things like that. So, uh, and, and we've got good speakers, clip speakers in our living room. So we get to hear this in first rate audio and really, really good quality video without leaving our couches. So if you're watching this free preview, consider the possibility of buying the whole show. And by the way, if you buy the show, you have 48 hours to watch the whole thing, so you can relive it a couple of times before it expires. That's uh, another good thing about the streaming thing. Yeah, and you know, think about right now in history where people are perhaps uh, somewhat uh, reluctant to travel or uh, unable to travel for various reasons, COVID-related or otherwise. Uh, this is a great benefit to have this in your living room, and it doesn't have to be an isolating experience. You know, if you've got fully vaccinated uh, friends and family, invite them over and have a dance party. You know, uh, I know people who've been doing that uh, you know, during this tour and during Fish Tour, uh, and it's a great thing. The, the social experience extends beyond the venues and into people's homes, and I love that. That's very true. We've got a friend here with us this evening. We've ordered dinner in, and we're going to enjoy the entire show together. And just the other night, Rita and I walked down the street to Blair and Regan's house and watched the whole show with them. Actually, after I finished my, I had to come back up here to do my uh, between sets thing with you. But it's really fun to watch it with other people. Yes, and 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 to dance with other people in your living room. And there's also the online social experience where people are you know, going on to social media and commenting on the show as it goes and saying, wasn't that amazing? What a great version of Cumberland Blues. I will pick that one out because, holy crap, what a great version of Cumberland Blues that was last uh, night. Yeah. yeah, I noticed there's a, a set list thread on Reddit. Or, and I checked, I went over there and took a look at it and watching, you know, people are commenting on the tour. You can do that in any little group of, you know, just you and your friends in a text chain or whatever. It's fun to share the observations with people. It's true. And I, I agree with you about this tour. I feel like I, I've gone back and reviewed a lot of the shows, pulling stuff to play on my radio show and, and all. And um, I, I do find that this music stands up to repeated engagements, especially in the jamming. That's the hardest part to do, right? And I really like that bird song again last night. There were whole stretches of music, unlike any I'd ever heard people doing in that song before. And it has to do with John Mayer's growing mastery of this songbook and the band's growing affinity for one another after all these years of playing together. Yeah, they're really exemplifying... Uh... A felicitous phrase that I first heard from Bruce Hornsby, where he says, I don't think of it as jamming. I think of it as creating new compositional moments. And this music is full of new compositional moments where someone will play a figure that everyone else will pick up on and build almost a new song within a song of it. And that's something I've always loved about Grateful Dead music. And these guys are, are hitting that consistently. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a, a a thing that happens late in the uh, versions of Franklin's Tower we've been hearing lately, where they sort of s slow things down and open up the feel and do that thing that almost reminds you of that mind left body jam from the 70s, right? Those kind of things. And, and there was a, a really sweet new intro to Jack Straw. We're hearing these, the, the band is like really stretching out and opening up and finding new places to converse with one another inside these songs. And that is the stuff, man. That's what I came to the Grateful Dead for in 1972. And that's why I'm so thrilled to hear it being played so well today by these guys. Yeah, uh, speaking of these guys, uh, the latest word that we got was none of them are on stage yet, but <laughs> that's okay because uh, they will be soon. And um, yeah, what 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 David just said, and, and the great thing about you know, this band is anyone can take the initiative to throw a new idea out there. You know, it isn't it isn't band leader and and side people ever. You know, like everybody's a leader and everybody's a responder, um, and. Uh, you know, there was there was a saying in the Grateful Dead world, everybody's soloing and nobody's soloing, you know, because there are spontaneous bits of musical creation happening that anyone else can respond to and can move everything in a different direction. Uh, I look forward to talking about this aspect of it with Bradford because he knows the wisdom of having a long term musical relationship with people. He's had his own band together for, I think, a couple of decades now. And through that you cultivate a common language and and a way of communicating that you really can't get any other way but he can also tell us about his experience of walking onto a stage full of total strangers playing a whole collection of music that he was not familiar with and he made himself instantly at home with it such that all that music was eventually released and they played together again subsequently that the magic of Branford Marsalis stepping up onto the stage with the Grateful Dead in '89, that in March of '89, that night, that's that, that is one of the greatest moments in Grateful Dead history, just because of the way, uh, you know, a, a guy with it with one immense world of music stepped into another immense world of music and made himself at home instantly. Was it '89 or '90? 90, I think 90. you're right, March of 90. Yeah. I don't know. Right. It all blurs That's together okay. after a while. It's all one big year. Anyway, um, so we were looking forward to the guys getting on stage. No one is looking forward to the guys getting on stage more than we are, but I'm sure the people in That's Hershey, right. Pennsylvania are looking forward to we, it as well. We're using a, a hashtag on Twitter to collect comments and questions from people. No guarantee that any of them will get used, but we're hoping to at least get some input from people. A D A W L G that stands for Dead Air with Lambert Gans. If you have comments or anything, I, I don't. I don't think we're going to need listener questions for Brantford because Lambert has this interview uh, completely staked out. I'm sure, but we'd love to hear your <laughs> comments and know that you're following along with us. And uh, and once again, we're doing this on nugs.net for the people who've already paid for the stream and also as part of the free sample that they put up on YouTube, youtube.com slash nugsnet. And by the way, all of the interviews we've already done are archived in the nugsnet uh, section of YouTube. And so you can go back and revisit the interviews we've already done uh, if you missed any of those. But if you if you come on board and buy the show during the second set, you still get access to the first set. You have the whole show for 48 hours to watch it again and again before it expires. And I will say we have been very fortunate in the quality and uh, eloquence of the guests we've been able to get on so far. We hit the ground running with Don Was. Um, we had our friends and... Uh, fellow deadheads and journalists, uh, Blair Jackson and Regan McMahon. Really loved talking to Michaela Davis the other night. Um, Cameron Can't Sears from the Rex Foundation. Yeah, and we've got some um, fun people lined up for future events as well. We're doing this every night of the Dead and Company tour, so we'll be doing a halftime interview on every one of the shows that remains, except on those nights when the weather forces them to cancel the set break, which happened once already. Right, and then the, the first night there was a shortened set break, so we bumped on was from opening night to the second night of the tour. We were ready for 
pretty much any eventuality that they throw at us. Um, and oh, this is our last night for a few days, though. The band is actually taking uh, a longer than usual break between shows. Um, I believe they reconvene on September second, so there's a few nights off. That's right. So uh, we'll make we'll make the most of this one, and uh, we wish the band a, a, a well earned uh, little respite. And then they will uh, come back swinging, I'm sure. Uh, and they'll be moving into the Midwest in uh, in the near future. Um, so, uh, plenty of great stuff coming up and we are looking forward to bringing it to you. And the, then the little break for dead and company means that I can resume my daily live performances at my scheduled time tomorrow. I'll be on at three o'clock <laughs> and I think, uh, I mean, sorry, Monday, I'm going to be playing at three o'clock with Mark Karen live from a recording studio out here, but I've been playing a live set on Facebook every day since April 4th, uh, since I've been stuck at home and I figured I had to do something to keep music happening. It's been really, really fun to do. Uh, and I've gotten to go out and play in front of people a few times, but mostly I'm staying home and playing and it's been great. Um, change the well, subject. That's, you know, that's a, well, that's actually been a great characteristic of this past year and a half. If, if there can be a, a silver lining to the weirdness we've been through, People have found new ways to reach out with their music and to enjoy other people's music. And of course, you know, we got that wonderful little series of live streams from uh, Bobby Weir from uh, TRI Studios with the Wolf Bros and then the ex the expanded Wolf Bros with the Wolf Pack. Uh, and that, I think, is going to be a major part of Bobby's musical future uh, in the coming months once uh, Dead & Company, Dead & Co., excuse me, no, I like Dead and Company. It's Wolf Bros and Dead and Company. That's right. I get my abbreviations Cordial. bollocks, but anyway. <laughs> but, but did but you, anyway. did you notice that certain members of the band called it Wolf Brothers the other night? I'm not so sure that it's a hard and fast rule that it's just Wolf Bros. But anyway, we may get to see some more Billy and the Kids as well. Those guys did some great live streaming events uh, during this time. And I, it's, you know, the COVID thing is getting weird again. And it may have some, some, some of the acts have already had to reschedule some dates. Various tours have been canceled because the Delta variant is causing, uh, upset and, uh, uh, unsafe conditions in various places. So we're all hoping for safety and sanity for all, especially for those of us who love live music and really, really, really miss the opportunity to be out there with other people hugging and stuff like that. Yeah, this isn't about ideology. It's about common sense. It's about um, concern for your neighbors, um, wanting to keep as many people as healthy as possible. And the numbers are showing that the places where the compliance is highest are the places that are coming closer to flattening the curve uh, with this surge that's happened with the Delta uh, variant. So please, if you are considering going to shows, you know, follow all the protocols, um, assure that everyone will have the best possible time under the safest possible conditions, please. Yes, we need that for the good of all. And also so that we can return to our life of celebrating communally in front of stages from coast to coast. It's what we love the most. Oh my God, that rhymed. I'm getting punchy, Gary. <laughs> That's okay. You know, it's a, uh, <laughs> you know, you could become a freestyle rapper in your old age, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we are uh, waiting for the band to go on stage. We're, we're told they're, they're only moments away, but we've been told that before. Uh, we can, we can only uh, tr trust so far. <laughs> I will say nice things about O'Teal Burbridge while we're killing time here. He had a birthday this week. He's been playing magnificently yes. as always uh, and singing beautifully too. They've given him a lovely little collection of the sweeter of Jerry tunes to sing. And it's been really, really wonderful to hear him in those spots. And his playing is so right on the money as well. Yeah. Uh, just an incredible asset to this band, but uh, every member of the band is an incredible asset to this band, and they feed off each other in, in amazing and surprising ways. You know, the the core guys, the founders. Oh, lights, that magic word. Enjoy the show, we'll everybody. See you the time, everybody. Have a good show. Well, okay. Yeah. 
Another great set. Huh. As has become routine. I guess so. We're getting spoiled here. It's pretty amazing music again. You want to run down that set list or shall I? I'll go right ahead. All right, I got it right here. Music Never Stopped. Easy Answer is a quick return to the Music Never Stopped. A touch of Gray, Tennessee Jed, Mr. Charlie, Black Throated Wind, Cassidy, and Don't Ease Me In. It's nice that Touch of Gray finally got played after being booted off the list uh, at the last second a couple of times already on this tour. Yeah, the song was starting to get a complex about that, so we're happy it was <laughs> redeemed. Uh, Don't Ease Me In, I love the way John Mayer has uh, taken over the lead vocal on that. It was the Grateful Dead's first single way, way back before they were signed to Warner Brothers on Scorpio Records. And uh, it's an old, old, old song dating back to the 1920s, I believe. Uh, Henry Thomas, the legendary Henry Thomas, wrote that one. I, and I believe it was recorded at Gene Estrabu's house on Buena Vista West in San Francisco, which later became Graham Nash's house. That's if correct. I remember correctly, yeah. That's Way correct. Back. Anyway, we're, uh, we're doing the set break uh, schmooze here for Nugs.net. And if you're watching the free preview of the Dead & Company show this evening on YouTube, you can convert that to a paid viewing of the entire show and also go back and watch first the set first set if you missed it by going to livedead.co or nugs.net, both of which wind up in basically the same place. I'm not sure what the differences are. But Nugs.net and LiveDead.co have many, many options for you to subscribe to this tour, watch the videos on this tour, do audio only uh, of this tour in many formats, and there's various other things like a subscription to Nugs.net that they would like you to check out. That's why we're doing this, to attract your attention, get you interested in Dead & Company, and get you interested in Nugs.net. But in addition to that, We've got a guest we're going to be talking to, right, Gary? Yeah, shall we bring him on right now? I would say so. Well, this is one of my most eagerly anticipated guests of the tour. Um, this gentleman wandered into the world of the Grateful Dead one memorable March night in 1990. He's been family ever since, but... I'd want to be talking to him, even if that never happened, because he's one of my favorite musicians and one of my favorite people. Will you please welcome Mr. Brantford Marsalis? Lambert, David, Hello. how are you? Nice to meet you. You as well. We're on a last, we're on a last name basis. <laughs> <laughs> we are for a long time. Anyway, now. that's right. It's great to see you, my friend, as always. Uh, and, uh, Great to be at a show together, although not together. <laughs> it's, right. uh, it's kind of a kind of a strange way of witnessing strange. it. Yeah, it is still strange, but uh, but I'm glad we're able to afford people who are not traveling right now the opportunity to do this, and so glad and so uh, thankful to you for joining us. So uh, we got some time to talk uh, while the band uh, retreats to their little lair, and uh, so let's get to it, man. Uh, how have you been doing in this uh, wacky year and a half? Uh, have you? Have you been keeping your creative shops together and your sanity and all those other things? Oh, yeah. I just, you know, the list of things you don't do well is very long. So I worked on striking some of those things off the list, you know, and uh, I put it to good use. I put it to good use. That's good to know. And that's been sort of a characteristic. I think a lot of people have found creative reserves in them and and ways of using the the unexpected free time to uh to handle some things in their lives that maybe needed handling needed a kind of a slow down moment in their life it's a longer moment than any of us would have cared to have but mm -hmm. uh it's worked out well for a lot of us and uh our hearts go out to the ones for whom it hasn't worked out well right. um yeah uh you know i, I think we should ask uh, you know We've heard this story a million times, but it turns out they're growing new new deadheads all the time who were not born in 1990 when you first uh, came mm. into the scene. So if you just give a brief summary of how you found yourself in this <clears throat> world and uh, what it was like for you. Okay. Uh, 
there's a, a, a music manager named Jim Louie who was working with a band in New York called Milk who were very ironically a, a dead cover band but they were doing a demo and he had, <clears throat> he asked me to uh, help him produce the demo and his cousin Annie used to Venus worked in video production for the dead right so you know, he arrives in town calls Jim said what are you doing I said oh I'm doing this project with Branford he goes, oh Phil loves him so I sent the message hey Phil how you doing he sends back a message come sit in with us we're playing in Nassau tomorrow I said well we're finishing this tonight so yeah tomorrow I'll drive to Nassau and because I was living in Brooklyn at the time and I go play with the band I didn't think I'd get in because I didn't have a pass I didn't have anything and <laughs> it's funny the dead culture yeah I'm supposed to play with the boys okay yeah go on in I couldn't believe that. So, uh, just walk in. Sure. I'm like, that's crazy. Cause I had already finished two tours with Sting. And I mean, you can't even go to the bathroom without a pass. And, uh, so I was, I was, whoa. So, uh, met the guys and they brought me up on the last song of the first set, which is the exact same thing I would do because. Other than Phil, they didn't know me. They didn't know whether I could fit in with the band or anything. So they bring you up. And if you sound like garbage, they can say, you know, thanks for playing and go home. <laughs> so, And it's only one song. It's not like the whole set is ruined. And I, and I got it. So we started playing and we just hit it off. It worked. And it was Bird Song, which is, is a song which would absolutely be in the wheelhouse of a gifted improviser. So... Uh, they made it. They made it easy on you, yeah, in a way. Yeah, but, but, but the extent to which you fit in and to which you acclimated yourself to that musical atmosphere was maybe I don't want to use the word magical, but maybe I do because there was an affinity there that's rare. You know, sometimes sit-ins are kind of awkward. You know, because people people defer. They say, "Oh, after you, no, after you," and then nothing gets said, or people step all over each other. But right. you were finding the right spaces in the music to step into, and the band was affording you the right spaces. And I'll tell you, I was, I'm a New Yorker who was living in California at the time, and I often tried to make it back for East Coast runs, but I couldn't because of work things. And my phone rang the next morning, and people said, did you hear what happened last night? And oh. I said, and man, <laughs> that was one trip east I will always regret I never made. But luckily, we got to see you sit in with the band a bunch more and some of the subsequent right. post-dead bands. And you've been speaking that language with those guys for more than 30 years now. One of our viewers was curious to know uh, how you wound up. Did they invite you to stay and play the whole second set with them? They did. I was I, I was. I'm a realist when it comes to these things. So after about 10 minutes of chatting, I said, well, look, man, thanks for letting me play. I appreciate it. And they said, no, you should stay for the second set. We're going to play Dark Star. We haven't played that in months. It's Did be you really know what Dark Star was? No, I didn't know. <laughs> but then when I heard it, I said, oh, okay, yeah, this I can do. <laughs> <That's> right <laughs> this... in my wheelhouse. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Uh, and the audience reaction there was a huge reaction when it started. So I said, okay, they were right. They hadn't played this in a while. And uh, yeah, it was fun. It was a fun concert. I mean, the trick is yeah, always we... to just stay out of the way. That's the trick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So many times in, 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 in the, the jazz world, a lot of people that play jazz, the reason that they actually like jazz is because they get to solo and that's their moment. And it's about them. Well, I like jazz because I actually like the sound of it. And the solo thing is real low on my list. I solo, but, uh, and when I was sitting in with the dead, I mean, I've always been, I, I grew up playing in a horn section in an R&B band. And the horn section is always invisible, but essential to the sound. And I'm completely comfortable with being a section guy, just playing in a section and playing an occasional eight bar solo. That's, I grew up doing that. So, uh, I don't mind blending in with the furniture as long as the band sounding good. And it's never going to sound good if I'm just playing and playing and playing instead of complimenting. So I think it worked out well because they're very complimentary musicians and uh, we were all sharing ideas. It was really cool. We were sharing ideas and 
it was fun. That was a fun, fun night. Yeah. And, you know, the primary concern for the Grateful Dead and the primary concern of the really good jazz musicians is not flaunting those chops, but enhancing the quality of the conversation. Right. Yeah, the song is, is the most important part, not the, 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 the harmony or the structure or any of that crap. It's more about the song, the sound of the song. How do I blend in with the sound of the song? Yeah. And one way is to always to, to wait. So I think that night particularly, I wouldn't really come in until the second verse. I would listen in the first verse and then uh, the chorus will come in in the second verse. And then the second verse is when I started to, to react to what was going on because I got a sense of the form and the sound. Great. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, because I, I think what we're seeing in the dead world now is something that you're used to, which is the intergenerational quality of musical right. tradition, the way the way there are mentors and students and students who become mentors and all that. And that's been going on in the post Grateful Dead world. And you, of course, come from an illustrious musical family and also from a city where there are yeah. like musical dynasties, you know, like le legendary families that that you know, that, that pass on the tradition. So the dead scene is kind of like analogous to that. You know, when we see cats like Jeff Cometti and O'Teal and John picking right. up the torch, you know, it's really, it's a very similar process to what I've experienced of New Orleans music and your family's music. Yeah, I mean, those guys are killing it too. I mean, it's fun to listen to. I mean, I've, yeah. known, I've known O'Teal and Jeff for a very long time in different settings. Uh, yeah. because Jeff used to be, what well, probably still is, but Jeff was in Rat Dog, and that's when I first yeah. met him. And yeah. uh, O'Teal was playing with a bunch of a bunch of guys. I think he was playing with, uh, I could be wrong, but I think he's playing with Colonel Bruce Hampton in the Aquarium Absolutely. Rescue Unit. First came up, yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, who else? I heard him with someone else. It could have been this kind of band, I think it might have been the, the, the Doobie Brothers band, or is it the Allman well, Brothers? I'm sorry, the no, Allman yeah, Brothers. Yeah, Allman Brothers. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. remember the yeah, Allman Brothers. The Allman wow. Brothers. That was the first time that I heard him, and I was like, man, between, you know, he, he, yeah, it was, it was, they were just firing. Because uh, I think Haynes was in that group too, Steve, uh, Steve, mm -hmm. Steve, well, Steve Warren, Haynes. Haynes. Warren, music Warren. Warren. Steve Haynes is, a, is, a, is the director of jazz studies at the University of uh, uh, North Carolina at Greensboro. So sorry about that. He's a good friend of sorry. mine. Warren, Warren Haynes was in there. And uh, who else was in there? Oh, man. Yeah, it was a, it was a, the almonds were there. But then the young guys were just were just killing it. Derek Trucks. Yeah, Derek. That's what Derek Trucks came into Whoa. Derek Trucks came into the band while while O'Teal was there, yeah, uh, and they yeah. you know they they maintained the traditions of the Allman Brothers band, and they also brought something really new to it. And I love right. you know what Jeff and John Mayer and O'Teal bring to Dead and Company is great because they have musical vocabularies that were cultivated after the Grateful Dead started, so they bring all right. this modern stuff into it. Uh, last night I heard. They played an incredible bird song, which was your first song with the Grateful Dead, by the way. They played a fantastic 20-minute version. And at one point, they got into this little kind of double-time vamp. And I heard Jeff starting to tease uh, Herbie's Cantaloupe Island. And, oh, uh, and O'Teal picked up on it right away. And I, I actually I texted Jeff today to verify if my ears didn't deceive me. And he said, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what it was. So, And I said, right. man, this band could take Cantaloupe Island, an incredible place. So that wouldn't have occurred to the guys in the Grateful Dead probably, you know, because right. they had their other vocabulary. So I, I love right. the way the music keeps reinventing itself, you know? Yep. I should interrupt quickly here and remind people that what we're offering here is a free preview of Dead & Company's show at Hershey Park tonight on uh, nugs.net. If you've already paid for this, then I'm just giving you an annoying interruption. But if you haven't yet paid for it and you're watching the free preview, <laughs> You can uh, convert this to a paid thing and watch that. You're going to get the first song of the second set only on this free preview. You could go to uh, nugs.net or livedead.co and sign up to buy the thing. And then you can go back and watch the first set as well. 
Uh, and uh, and there are other things going on that NugsNet wants you to know about. And um, you can find out all about them at livedead.co. And now back to your conversation. All right. Um, also talking in, the, in terms of lineage and mentors, of course, you are the son of a great musician, uh, a great mentor uh, to not just to your family, but to generations of New Orleans musicians. And he spent time in New York as well as you know, part of the larger jazz community. Uh, Ellis Marsalis, who we unfortunately lost last year. Um, but his legacy is being carried on uh, with something called the Ellis Marsalis Center for Music. And I know, uh, right. you know we, try to, we try to support a lot of good causes here d during the course of this. And uh, I was very happy to hear about the establishment of this. So can you tell us a little bit about the Ellis Marsalis Center? Uh, it was, it was uh, we started building it uh, as part of the Musician's Village right after the whole crazy thing with Katrina in 2005. And it is basically uh, an after-school center focused on kids in the Upper Ninth Ward neighborhood who can, we, we're using music as a way to just have uh, kids use their brains. We're not trying to train, per se, the next young generation of musicians, but we're using music uh, to keep these kids intellectually engaged and they can do their homework at the center because a lot of the kids in the neighborhood, uh, their parent works or both their parents work in, uh, they're in that dreadful weird hour where they're spending three or four hours at home watching television or sitting on the porch or worse. So we're trying to fill that space by, uh, giving, a hundred kids, some place to go, and uh, I think we started in two thousand seven, and it's been going. It's been going strong. It's doing doing w really well. That's wonderful. Great. And <clears throat> and uh, you can find out about that uh, by checking out Ellis Marcellus Center dot org, and I recommend that you do so, please. Um, man, there's so much we can talk about, Bran. I mean. Uh, you know, yes, we, Lambert, we, we, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Go off into all kinds of tangents. You know, another another thing about you know, commonalities in this music is what we get from Bobby and Billy and Mickey in this band is that incredible core relationship of musicians who have played together as long as they have. You know, right. I mean, and and that creates something that's irreplaceable. And I've been thinking your band has been together for a really long time now with Joey Calderazzo and Eric Rivas. <clears throat> and uh, I think, I think the drummer is the new kid, he's, he's, but he's been with you for more than 10 years now. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not anything like, you know, like the guys, like, you know, like you said, Mickey, Bill and the, I'm spacing. Bobby. No, I'm, <laughs> thank you. God, Bob. Sorry, bro. <laughs> I'm 61, <laughs> man. It's not like it used to be. Uh, but it's nothing like those guys. You know, they've been together for like 50 years. I mean, it's, they've been together a long time. Uh, yeah. yeah, this particular iteration of the group is, is about 10 years old. But Joey joined the band in 98 and Eric joined the band in 96. And yeah, we're, we're still finding places to play, I mean, places to go in the music. We're still finding places to go. So uh, that's the fun part. We're not, it's not a nostalgia band. We're, we're, we're getting after it. And that's the great thing about the guys is like, you know, it's not a nostalgia band. They're getting after it. Right. Now, I, I got to hear you guys play a pretty rare club gig, a one night club gig in New York a while back. Uh, and oh, Phil yeah. was there that night. Phil, Phil, That's Phil happened true. to be he in New York. Through. I know that was really cool of him yeah. to do that. Yeah. He and came, man, and yeah, you guys, that, 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 old, that club's gone now. I think it's the jazz standard. The ja jazz standard. Although I'm hearing that space may find new life uh, as a club. Oh, so good. we're, we're hoping good. for it. Yeah. Um, well, Pete strong. Shapiro, Pete Shapiro from the Lock and Festival and Capitol Theater and all right. that has actually been using the space as a webcasting studio during the pandemic wow. and having performances there that the rest of the world can see. And there's talk about maybe, 
getting it open again as a club. I hope I'm not talking out of school, but there's been chatter. No, I'm, 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 that's uh, great. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that proves to be true. Yeah, because be it's great. a beautiful room. And man, you guys, you guys were burning in that room. I got to say, I love that band and, uh, you know, at the peak of your powers. So, oh, thanks, brother. Yeah. Now, you've gotten to get out and gig a little bit. Did you go overseas pretty recently yeah. for some gigs? Yeah. Yeah, we were in Europe for two weeks. Playing in places that we normally play in places we don't normally play. So we played in Tbilisi in Georgia first time. That was great. Uh, the three big cities in, in, in Poland, we play there all the time. You know, Warsaw, Krakow, and uh, Gdansk, or as we say, Gdansk. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, the, the, you know the, those places are just, Poland's a real music country. So uh, they really respond to instrumental music well, which is nice. Uh, played in a town in Germany that I've never played before in uh, Karlsruhe, which is about two hours from Frankfurt. So it was really great to play an 11 p.m. show in Perugia in the Umbria region of Italy. Wow. And after the show, take a bus to drive to Rome, arrive at 4 a.m., wake up at 8 to take a 1020 flight to Frankfurt, followed by a two and a half hour drive. And we had about two hours off before we did two shows that night, starting at 630. I was like, man, I haven't done anything like this since I was young. This was great. It was absolutely insane. You know, so, uh, but we, yeah, we pushed through it. We, we survived it. It was great. You know, I wonder if it was the very same venue. There was a legendary video from about 1967 of the Miles Davis Quintet with Herbie and Wayne and Ron and Tony playing in Carlsruhe. So I wonder. I, I'm pretty sure it is not the same venue. Oh, okay. <laughs> I feel comfortable in saying that. No, <laughs> not the same venue. Well, Car Carlsruhe got lucky a couple of times in history, at least. They got you and they got Miles. <laughs> Not too bad. Yeah, that must have been that must have been something. Yeah, that band. Yeah, it's out. They put it out. They put out a box set of Miles' '67 Europe tour, and they included the a DVD of the of the the, the film music. And it's man, you know, yeah. talk about a band with telepathy. Yeah, they were firing. Yeah, That's a great band. Yeah, yeah. So, um, have you been able to make any you know <laughs> definitive long term? plans to get back out on the road or is, is everybody sort of sitting back a bit and waiting to see how these things develop no we're we you know we're, we're good we're, we're ready to go and uh i think that a lot of uh concert promoters and <clears throat> municipalities are waiting around but we have a a west coast tour scheduled for october for like a three weeks three weeks on the west coast and uh right. next year uh Man, from January to June, it's just explosive. It's so many concerts and so much stuff. So uh, oh. I'm just resting up for next year because that's going to be good. Well, it's going to be tiring, but it'll be good. Yeah. Let's hope it's safe. Yeah, yeah, well, you do what you can. I mean, you know, you get your vaccine, you wear your masks when you need to, and most places in Europe are already kind of, you know, they're going to have uh, vax card mandates. A lot of places in Europe haven't, haven't had access to the vaccine. Uh, like in Georgia, there was only 3% of the population that even had access to the vaccine. But wow. it was an outdoor concert, so it was fine. Most of the concerts were outdoors. And, yeah, uh, and it's... It's, you know, it's, it's good to, to see stay. more. I'm oh, sorry. It's, yeah. it's, oh, yeah. the, 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 the virus is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. So you just have to uh, be smart about it. Just don't be reckless, you know. And uh, every yeah. country we went into, as soon as we got to the border, they're like, vaccine cart, please. They weren't messing around. And, good. you know, and, and that stuff that we have in, 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 at home here, 
you didn't see people running around screaming, I refuse to wear this mask on the plane. Everybody just does what they're supposed to do. Yeah, you they know, just do, I, I they just do it. I'm, I'm old enough to have been around when when polio was still a thing, you know, and getting right. a polio shot was accepted and routine. And the people who were talking against it were so on the fringe. You know, there was like right. such a national mission to take care of this thing. And I hope we can, you know, educate the ed the educable and enlighten those who can be enlightened to the greatest extent possible. In the meantime, you know, I'm glad that a lot of the arts presenting organizations and the national promoters are doing the right thing in terms of, you know, regulating right. who can come to the show, you, you know, have. what the rules are. Yeah. The history of the United States is fraught with a, a jackass contingency that's roughly one third of the population, there was one third of the population who thought we should remain loyal to King George. There was one third of the population who started a ridiculous civil war where all the industry was on the northern side and the population, and they somehow thought they could win. I mean, I could just go on and on. So I wasn't surprised by this. I'm like, there they are again. The third of the country from the lower third, there they are. And but they're at the end of the day we give outsized energy to fringe mentality. I don't know why we do that, but we tend to do it. And, uh, yeah, well, I'm, there's I'm money not, in I'm, it, I guess. I don't, is there really, I, I just, I, clearly I the fear and loathing industry is thriving in this country. Uh, in yeah, the, in this full outrage. Yeah, the fear, you're right. You're right. You're right. Touche. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not as, you know, I mean, maybe it's because I grew up in the South and I have a lot of friends and there's certain subjects where they are not educable. Their minds are made up and I wouldn't spend five minutes trying to dissuade them. You know, I just wear my mask. <laughs> I'm just not, I'm not having this stupid debate. I'm not even having it because it, it's stupid. So I understand so, that. Yeah. So, so rather than spend all your time trying to, change people's minds man let them do their thing over there let them do it it's yeah. fine we just yeah. got to figure out how to work around them and through them and, and past them we're, well we always have we always have to yeah. deal with them well but they're, they're, they're not going anywhere and you know i mean we're supposed to be the place that you know we allow people to have their beliefs i mean but i also believe in that old sign that says no shirt no shoes, no service. So <laughs> exactly. Nope. Nobody exactly. says you have to wear a shirt, but you can't bring your, ass right in your here. neighbors. There's a nice <laughs> tradition we used to have around here too. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, hey, Brantford. I think we're hearing the band is arriving back on stage. As cool. always, my friend. You know, I, I love talking to you as much as any human on the planet. Um, always a blast, and uh, <clears throat> we hope. We can be together in the same space sometime. It goes without saying that you are always welcome on the Dead and Company stage whenever it's possible for people to mingle again. So, uh, you know, come on around when you can. Yes, sir. I look forward to it. All right, Lambert. Great nice to meet you, you, David. You too. All right, Thank you. you. All right, Gary. You Take soon, care, brother. brother. All right. Okay. Bye. Well, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, and the band should be arriving soon uh, on stage soon. Let's. Uh... Let's remind people that it's a free nugs.net sample of the Dead and Company show tonight. And if you're enjoying this on YouTube, you can go to uh, livedead.co and pay for it and watch the whole thing. And you can get it in 4K as well if you have the hardware for it. They're broadcasting in the highest possible resolution right now. And I can tell you as a trained audio professional, the mix is amazing and the audio quality is spectacular. And by the way, if you don't want to get into the video thing, you can download, you can subscribe to nugs.net audio feed and download the shows. And I wish you'd probably turn it over to the stage right now. What do you think, Gary? Well, we haven't gotten lights yet. We haven't been told lights. Oh, okay. So, uh, um, in, in, in that, uh, so didn't I tell you that was going to be a cool conversation, man. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Brand by the way, the Jay Blake it, mentioned that uh, the house where they recorded uh, uh, Don't Ease Me was next door to the house that later became Graham Nash's house. Okay. I All thought right. it was the same house, but Jay knows he lives yeah. in the city. 
Indeed. Um, so yeah, so the band, uh, the band we are told is uh, coming back to the stage. Um, and spe oh, speaking of the, 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 the realm of sound and it's sounding so good, we always have to give a shout out to the great Derek Featherstone, the house yes, sound indeed. person for Dead & Company, and also the Nugsnet folks who translate that sound that he gives them into beautiful and pristine sound on your TV or whatever your listening device is. Uh, I, I've been so happy with the mixes. I have been downloading these shows, you know, the morning after and collecting stuff to play on various radio shows. We should, by the way, mention that Gary and I are co-hosts of Tales from the Golden Road on Sirius XM's Grateful Dead channel. And tomorrow from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern, we'll be opening the phones and talking to people. Love to hear your stories about things. But we're also going to break our format a little bit. We usually play two short pieces of music. But Lambert and I were both so blown away by the bird song from last night that we're going to carve out a little extra time and play that whole 20 minute thing in its entirety. That's how strongly we believe in that particular piece of music. So join us tomorrow, 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM 23, the Grateful Dead channel. The show is called Tales from the Golden Road and you participated in it by calling and telling us a story. And we've been doing it for more than 13 and a half years. And there is no sign of the interest in this music and this band and this universe flagging. And uh, we're so happy to have the opportunity to talk to people about it every Sunday. And so uh, we're really looking forward to tomorrow's show. We're really looking forward to Dead & Company being back on stage. Any second now, as we have been told uh, by people who should know. So uh, yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, waiting for that to Fred, happen. Fred sent us the the signal that the lights were down, and then said, "Sorry, false alarm." False so alarm. we've been right. cranked that, that was, in our program. No, that was actually se se several minutes earlier. I think that was so. Uh, so anyway, we'll uh, we we know they're almost there, and. Uh, you know, I've always I've had this running joke with Bob Weir for a long time where, you know, I, I, I talk I talk to Bob about you know, how, how a tour is. And he, he, he says it's getting there. And I, I said, you know, Bob, you've been I said, Bob, you've been telling me that since 1973 now. So uh, <laughs> so this is kind of a microcosm of that process. The band is getting there. Those, those guys are always doing that. They've always kind of been, you know, denigrated their own work just a little bit and never quite, you know, it's, and then that's fine. You want an artist to always feel tension between what they're achieving and what they think they're capable of. But right. that's been kind of one of those things, you know, that none, none of them wants to stand up and go, yep, we're great. And that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I I agree. I think you always want to be in a perpetual state of getting there rather than saying I've arrived. That's exactly so. Yeah. Anyway, but we're getting awfully philosophical in our old ages uh, because we have to wax philosophical because we have no choice because we're getting paid to talk until the band is on stage, which should be really, really soon. We might want to mention the fact that even though he's 73 years old, Bob Weir still has really, really great legs. Have you noticed that? Oh, he was oh, wearing I, the short. I, he was wearing shorter shorts last night, but you, he's still pretty. Uh, my, the, my, my wife is saying yes, indeed. The women notice that. Yeah, you know, he, he, he's, he's calling to mind those like those, those old totally ripped guys on Venice Beach. You know, those, those, those like those bodybuilders you see on Venice Beach in Southern California who look a little like old prospectors, but also are incredibly just buff. Um, yeah, Bob's kind of cultivating that look these days. Somebody on Twitter wanted to know if there was a reason why he decided to become so healthy and, and fit and all. And I just thought um, staying healthy and fit into your 70s is motivation enough, right? You didn't need a specific yeah. thing. Oh, my wife asked me to take off some weight. <laughs> I think uh, I think Bob has arrived at the conclusion that longevity is a pretty cool thing. Um, he's always talked about that. He's always said, you know, his role models were people like Count Basie, who who played into their seventies, and Duke Ellington. All you know, the guys who were in it for the long haul. Duke Ellington's great line. Someone asked him if he was going to retire, and Duke Ellington said, "Retire to what?" Right. And I think Bob's got that. I think Bob's got that philosophy too. 
I, I have, I'm under the impression that Bob Dylan got that from his time hanging out with the dead, that he realized that all of his heroes, you know, Hank Williams, all those people were lifers and they just kept playing. It's like, and I remember Paul Kantner said that to me once, retire from playing? Right. You know, it's not something you retire from. It's, what, it's something you do until you can't do it anymore. I intend to keep yeah, playing yeah. music until I can't play music anymore. And I expect you do too. Oh yeah, no, it's 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 an incredible gift to have, and yeah, I think it keeps you younger, or at the very least, keeps you immature, which is just as important. But getting back to the Bob Weir, the fit, cut, seventy-three-year-old, I I think it's a, just a simple matter of wanting to be healthy and happy. I took some steps to ensure my longer life as well, because who wants to spend your food budget on insulin? <laughs> well put, indeed. So. Uh, the band has been arriving on stage. Yeah, the band has been arriving on stage for some time. Lights, Good night. Lights, yay, we'll see we're ya. done. <laughs>